In 2005, a rancher and amateur fossil hunter friend of ours discovered the remains of a nearly complete animal from the late Cretaceous. The Displetosaurus that he found is a member of the Tyrannosaur family, but predates T-Rex by about 10 million years. Like so many impressive dinosaur skeletons, this one soon acquired a nickname. Our Displetosaurus became Pete III, often shortened to just Pete. A Displetosaurus is a large-headed, small-armed, meat-eating dinosaur. It's related to T-Rex, probably about 10 million years older than it, though. This one ended up being one of the most complete ones that we've ever recovered. With Tyrannosaurs, based on previous histology work where they cut bones apart and look at lines of arrested growth in the bone, they've come up with a matrix that basically you can take the length of the femur, plug it in there, and it'll spit out however old the animal was when it died. With Pete, when we've done that, it turns out that it was about 22 to 24 years old. So this animal has various things like dish in its spine, which is where the ligaments start to, start to turn to bone and, and, and all fuse together. It's got avulsed tendons, it's got weird things on its ribs too that originally we thought were breaks, but it turns out that it looks like it had a lung infection before it died as well. We actually think that we have the last meal of Pete preserved with this animal too. The, uh, the only other dinosaur bone fossil that was found in this was a uh, duckbill dinosaur lower jawbone in the chest cavity of the animal. When we collect these dinosaurs, we pick up all kinds of other fossils with it. And in this case, we've picked up a bunch of plants as well. Um, almost all of them are metasequoia. They're almost like cycads. So um, it was showing that the environment that this animal died in was kind of a swampy environment with evergreen trees. We start by digging back into the rock and tracing the fossil. We dig until we stop finding more bone, and then dig a little more just to be sure that we've got everything. This process is called perimetering. We expose as little of the bone in the field as possible. We just want to see what's there so we can make a plan to safely remove it from the ground. We dig a pedestal around the fossil and undercut it slightly. Then we soak burlap in a high density plaster and wrap the bone. Once it cures, we have a hard field jacket that will cradle the fossil and the rockets in while we transport it back to the lab. Gathering scientific data is a critical part of paleontology. Without taking thorough notes on the geology, paleo environment, locality, and the specimen itself, the dinosaur loses its value to researchers. In this case, we learned that Pete was part of an event called a crevasse splay. A natural levee built up in the oxbow of a river, and Pete's body washed up against it. When the water level rose, and the levee broke, Pete washed out and was reburied, where we eventually came to find him. It's only through observing and interpreting the local geological clues that we can learn stories like this. The dig itself was pretty interesting because the entire animal was only covered by about 18 inches of matrix. That's the rock that's on top of the animal um, that we have to remove in order to get down to a specimen. It was in fairly poor shape. The bones themselves were just in really fragile and fragmented conditions. The last jacket that we brought out of the ground had about 12 feet of torso, neck, and even tail that were all articulated together that we could not pull apart in the field. So we uh, went around the specimen, covered it with plaster, and actually built a small uh, pallet sled underneath the animal so that we could get around it, jacket it safely, without even flipping the, the, uh, the articulated dinosaur. After that, we just hauled it back onto a trailer and drove it down to Colorado at our workshop to finish. Field work is just the beginning. When we get back to the lab, the real labor starts. Fossil preparation is the process of removing the rock from the bone and then cleaning the bones up for display and study. We've got a few basic tools that we use for fossil preparation. First is the air scribe. It's like a miniature jackhammer that chips the rock away. We use air abrasion, which is like a tiny version of a sandblaster to clean off the surfaces of the bones. Pin vices and X-Acto knives help us do a lot of the small things. And magnification helps us see a lot of tiny details so we can get really nitty gritty with the work. We use a variety of glues to stabilize the bone and keep it together. Some of the most important tools we use are notebooks and cameras so we can document every stage of what we're doing. It's remarkable how often taking thorough scientific data helps us even years down the road when we're doing a reconstruction or studying a fossil. Pete gave us some fun challenges during preparation. The poor preservation of the fossil meant that we had to take even more care than usual not to damage it as we worked. We also had to invent new techniques to stabilize it. 
Once preparation is complete, it's time to mold the bones so we can make cast copies to share with other museums and researchers. Molding begins by building up clay around the bone and constructing a retaining wall around the whole assembly. Next, we pour liquid silicone over everything. Silicone has such fine resolution that we capture detail down to almost the microscopic level. When the silicone cures, we turn everything over, remove the clay, and pour fresh silicone on the second side. When that cures, we carefully remove the bone. The next step is to pour liquid plastic into the mold. We use a two-part resin that, when it's set up, is much stronger and lighter than the original fossil, but still preserves all of the detail. With Pete, we wanted to make sure that every little crack and fracture in the original bone was visible. For this mount, we wanted something special. Dinosaurs are normally posed in a boring running or standing position. We opted for a more dynamic pose, where the Displetosaurus was interacting with another dinosaur. For the main support, we put heavy steel inside the molds before casting. This way, we could hold the major limb elements in the position we wanted and simply weld them in place. Um, our biggest goal with, with all of our skeletons is to uh, make them nice and dynamic and give, give people an idea of what these things could have done in nature. Right, and with, uh, with our Displetosaur, we, we definitely wanted it to, uh, to be mounted on only the legs. We didn't want any extra support at all, so um, that, was, that was another one of the big challenges is to uh, beef the metalwork up enough that we're, uh, we're not having to, keep, having to back pedal and uh, add extra supports. And the skull was, a, was a very challenging because the Ceratopsian is mounted horizontally and it puts a twist on the skull. So that was uh, the main challenge for me was in the skull and, and trying to beef that metalwork up enough to actually hold the, uh, the Ceratopsian level. Uh, we wanted a dynamic skeleton that worked well and was easy to look at and imagine the thing in life. So. The coolest and most fun part for me is actually having interaction between the two animals. Um, I, I just get a kick out of looking at a skeleton and imagining what it would have been in life and to have two animals together and actually seeing a scene that would have taken, a pla taken place millions of years ago is just so exciting. It took over a decade of work from the discovery of the Displetosaurus to getting it out on display, and we're really excited to finally see it all put together. Thank you for visiting the Dinosaur Resource Center, and please tell your friends about us. If you'd like to know more, talk to one of our visitor experience guides. They can answer any questions you have.